Good evening and welcome to Transistence, your weekly news and commentary show dealing with events from around the world that impact the trans and trans adjacent community. I'm one of your co-hosts, Genevieve Bergman. I'm your other co-host, Emily. I hope you all are having a wonderful night tonight. Thank you all so much for being here. Let's jump into our first story, shall we? Um, the Dutch Constitution will be amended to ban LGBTQ plus discrimination. This sounds like very good news to start the day. This is really super news because with the Dutch Constitution, there were already blanket statements that said that all citizens of the Netherlands shall be treated equally in equal circumstances, and it offered protections based upon religion, belief, political opinion, race, and sex. It also states that discrimination on any other grounds whatsoever shall not be permitted. So the Constitution was already a beautiful piece of saying, we're going to make this a protected environment for all people. All people will share equal rights and discrimination will not be allowed on any grounds whatsoever. But then they went ahead and they added in bans on discrimination against sexual orientation and disability. Now, we are, you know, we're still struggling to figure out what discrimination looks like against people with disabilities, even though we've had the Americans with Disabilities Act for, God, decades now. And it still has not been, you know, proven to be effective. But we're hoping, you know, that maybe, just maybe, the Netherlands can show us a little bit about how to make equal rights for all people a possibility. Yeah, it's so interesting when we have to look outside of our country to find that, you know, considering what we've we've talked about it before, what our beliefs were on how forward thinking the United States was and how we were the country of freedom and all of that, all of that rhetoric. And now it's right. like there's just so many, so many pieces of evidence of why that's not true and why so many other countries are taking the lead on that. So at least somebody is stepping forward on it. I like that. Absolutely. Moving over to the UK for um, uh, an in-depth look into how the UK will ban conversion therapy, but they've added back in the clause of transgender folks in there. Right. This has been a contentious back and forth for, I want to say, almost a year. The, the movement to place a ban on conversion therapy began right around this time last year, but there had been a disagreement on whether or not that ban should include a ban on conversion therapy for people who are transgender, non-binary. And groups such as the LGB Alliance were pushing hard among, you know, pushing hard into the secretaries and the ministers of England to ensure that Essentially, conversion therapy would exclude transgender people. So now that we're seeing this shift back to including transgender therapy, conversion therapy banned, we also have to look at what is the possibility of, you know, this getting done at a um, at a reasonable amount of time. And that's where things are beginning to look a little more difficult. It looks like this is going to stretch out for some time because, first of all, we cannot get the the UK government to, you know, basically squash any conversation that denies transgender people their rights. Remember, it was the UK and their sec their primary, you know, prime secretary, I think it was, um, who denied the Scotland Gender Recognition Act from being approved. And so the UK was like, no, we're not going to do this because it will it will throw everything into upheaval here in the UK. And so we're not going to accept this. That Recognition Act would have made it much easier for transgender non-binary individuals to update their documents. But the UK said, no, we're not going to do that. We have also seen a lot of pressure within the government to ensure that transgender people are being treated not as 
gender equals, but as gender imposters. We've seen people such as J.K. Rowling, who have a huge influence upon how things are being done in the UK right now. And it's, it's looking kind of iffy on whether or not this will actually get carried through. This may be just some early promises to kind of smooth things over with Scotland, but with Ireland also, or with Wales also pushing in the direction of trying to create a better place for uh, transgender recognition. And in just a little bit, we're going to, I think we're going to talk about Ireland moving in a very similar direction. So it may be that the UK is just throwing out a few little, you know, breadcrumbs to make it look like they are acquiescing to including transgender people in their conversion ban. Mm -hmm. Well, and the issue that we've had, we've seen, we've seen it a lot in the U S bills that have been going through where um, there've been exclusions that have mm -hmm. somehow harmed folks where it's like, you know, the, the bill does one thing, but there's ex an exclusion that, that, that harms or, you know, excludes trans people. Yeah. Um, and, and it's nice that, the hint is that they're removing this because it's really important to remember that conversion therapy does not work. It's extremely right. harmful. Um, people revert back to their behavior anyways after a certain amount of time. But what you've done is you've you've scarred and, and hurt them um, mm -hmm. without achieving your goal. So conversion therapy is a bad thing regardless of, of what you're using it for. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that the, the evidence is out there that it's a very bad thing and it's ineffective and I'm, I'm I'm hoping that UK follows through with this and does ban does include the the transgender folks in that ban of conversion therapy. Yeah, interesting side note that is you know just the irony of it all. Um, the UK actually considers conversion therapy a form of torture, but they're willing <laughs> to keep it for transgender people. Mm -hmm. Great, that's just lovely. Okay. So now we get deeper into the fight regarding the gender reform bill that Scott, Scotland has put forth. And the Tories are blaming equal pay and same-sex spaces for blocking Scottish, the, the Scottish gender reform bill. So uh, what is, is coming in with this scapegoating here? Uh, basically, this is bullshit. Um, <laughs> they're trying to make their, their bigotry sound like they are trying to protect cisgender women. Mm -hmm. What they are arguing is that, you know, the decision to, you know, exclude transgender people from recognition was based upon the Equality Act of 2010, and that if they allowed transgender people that, that level of respect and that level of equal treatment, then things such as single sex clubs, and we're not talking about we're not talking about sex clubs, we're talking about like women's only clubs or men's only clubs, which by the way, here in the United States, we've been trying to remove those from, you know, public access. But single sex clubs, associations, schools, but also protections such as equal pay. The feeling is that the bill, you know, risks creating significant complications from having two different gender recognition regimes in the UK and allowing more fraudulent or bad faith applications. So once again, not only are we being accused of, you know, associate guilt by association when it comes to predators, but now we are also being you know, looked at guilt by association for frauds and hucksters. So, you know, thanks UK for giving us a whole new level of crimes that we don't commit, but you want to associate with us. Ah, <sighs> yeah, just more of that throwing anything up on the wall to see what'll stick to yeah. to the transgender community as a negative, so that you can push forward your nasty agenda. Exactly. Ugh. Um, well, the Scottish government um, fundamentally rejects the offer to work with the Tories on on the revised bill. Did you um, cover that just now, Ben? 
No, I didn't. Because okay. basically what happened was is that the Tories were like, hey, we want to sit down and we want to talk with you about a possibility of, of maybe working through this and finding something that was kind of equitable. And the Scots said, oh, no, go fuck yourself. But basically <laughs> they were like, no, we're not going to sit down with you. We're not going to talk with you about this. You showed no good faith in doing this. You showed no cooperation in doing this. You told us you weren't going to do this. You didn't give it a fair shake. So why don't you go? and find my sheep and tend to them. <laughs> very colorful response. I love it. Thank you very much. I'm sure that was uh, direct quotes, all direct quotes. All direct quotes, all, direct all quotes. from the Scottish Prime Minister. <laughs> uh, just kidding, y'all. Just kidding. It's Rosa, goddamn. Rough crowd tonight. <laughs> Rough crowd tonight. <laughs> um, Russia has been ordered to recognize same-sex relationships by European by Europe's top court. What is going on here? Okay, so this is an interesting little bit of So you you have Russia which is doing everything within its power to criminalize LGBTQ+ plus people within Russia. They are also trying to do everything they can to militarily subsume the Ukraine into their control. And now they are rumbling that they're willing to consider a nuclear option if they can't get Ukraine. So Europe, the European Court of Human Rights has been dealing with a case where three queer couples were fighting for legal recognition and protection after they were denied the ability to get married in Russia. So the European Court of Human Rights has been going back, has been dealing with this case since before the invasion of Ukraine. Now the court has come forward and they have said Russia must make a, you know make way to allow recognition for queer couples for queer marriages and you know this is this is a part of the broader you know european connection that's there it's possible that this will have some kind of negative impact on russia as they kind of try to move forward but at the same time as long as vladimir putin not putin putin is in place um there is going to be considerable rejection of this we're we're not going to see um you know we're not going to see russia back down from their their anti-lgbtq plus rhetoric we're not going to see them back down from their um antagonistic behaviors so this is a nice move on the part of the on the european court but at the same time this is not going to go anywhere anytime soon but we can always hope mm -hmm. And what what is it in the relationship of of Europe and Russia that gives them the at least uh, the apparent uh, apparent authority to make some sort of demand like this to them? Well, the European you know Court on Human Rights is you know just one step below the United Nations mm. Human Rights um, committees. So with the European Court, you could kind of look at it like. The European court is the appeals courts or the districts courts here in the U.S. You know, if somebody does something in one of the states, it goes up to a U U.S. Uh, district court for an appeal. So this is going to be that. The next step is, is that if Russia doesn't recognize this, it could bounce up to the U.N. and we could be looking at sanctions. We could be looking at different forms of disciplinary action from the U.N. on this. Interesting. Yeah. That's crazy how that works with the uh, sort of like you said, like an appellate system. Like this is right. the, the lower now, court. There's no, there's no direct up. connection. There's no direct link, but at the same time, we're you know, the UN is going to be looking at the European Court of Human Rights to make a huge decision on whether or not human rights are being respected. We are in the middle of watching Russia commit war crimes in Ukraine. So when you throw all of this in together, three 
queer couples wanting to be married in Russia may not appear to be much, but at the same time, if all of this gets lumped together as a war crimes case, then we may see that, you know, this may be a broader human rights concern. Now let's move on to the story that rocked uh, our world here, at least, um, in just it's, it's just how scary this proposal is. But what um, a new West Virginia obscenity bill could potentially jail people for transgender exposure to minors, which it, as the as it's bitten as it's written, just basically being transgender near minors. So yes. um, what did you find out as you dove into this one? So uh, Senate Bill 252 and Senate Bill 278 were released almost at the same time earlier last week, or they were introduced at the same time last week. In both of those bills, it is addressing matters of obscene definition. And in the first one, there was a lot of focus on schools and the, the you know, association with being on school property. And people were saying, oh, well, this only applies to schools. In the second one, though, it becomes a little clear that what 278 is referencing and what 252 is also tied with is a portion of the West Virginia Code, Section 61A8-1. It is the definitions of obscene matter to minors. So this is, I'm going to put the text of this in the chat. So if anybody wants to look this up, you are more than welcome to. Um, this is the code, the, the section of the Code of West Virginia that is being edited to read this, for the purposes of any prohibition, protection, or requirement under any and all articles and sections of the Code of West Virginia protecting children from exposure to indecent displays of a sexually explicit nature, such prohibited displays shall include, but not be limited to, any transvestite and or transgender exposure performances, or display to any minor. Now, this is directly within the definitions of what obscene matter is described as. Obscene matter is already described as um, any type of material that appeals to the prurient interests um, anything that is patently offensive, sexually explicit conduct, lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Now, those three right there have been categorically defined as obscene material definitions. But what West Virginia has now done is they are adding, they're adding this line that says it shall be. Be, it shall include, but not be limited to, transvestite and or transgender exposure, performance, or display to any minor. What we're worried about is what exposure or display mean. Because of the words that are defined, those two words are not clearly defined, nor is it set out what those words mean. But from the broadest understanding of this, since this is it, it's put within the section of the code that deals with obscene matter in the same way that pornography, whether it be printed or video or uh, um, sexual explicit activity in a club along those lines, what this is saying is that any effort of a transgender person to expose themselves or display themselves to a minor. And I'm not talking about in a nudity form because that is not is what is stated here. It says that any transgender exposure. So Emily and I happen to go out on the street in West Virginia, dressed as we are for a business meeting, just like we are right now. 
and there happens to be kids on the street, according to this bill, according to the changes that they are arguing for, we would be exposing minors to transgender matter. But this is the most offensive part of this. What this is saying is that transgender people are essentially the same as pornographic magazines or videos. What this one sentence represents is a complete dehumanization of transgender people to nothing other than obscene material. So as we go about our lives, as we go about living out who we are, just the mere existence of a transgender person in the presence of a minor, that is obscene exposure. But you have to take one step back, and what you have to say is, if that person is not in the presence of a minor, they are still obscene matter if they should become exposed to a minor. This is one of the most horrific bills that could have been written anywhere in the world. This is a direct attack on our humanity. This is an effort to illegalize, to criminalize, to make a transgender person less than a human, but obscene material which can be banned and thrown away and discarded. This is a huge step in genocide. This is a huge effort to, to criminalize a group of people just for their existence. This is where I wish we had a lawyer on staff to find out uh, if something like this, you know, a lot of those things that in the obscenity law sound like sex offender kind of behavior, you know, and, and I'm just wondering, you know, because like you've, you've heard the thing about like, if, if you're caught peeing outside near a school, ex exposing your genitals, basically, um, you could be branded a sex offender. Um, yes. But reg regardless of that silly anecdote, um, if is it possible with this? Um, I know that two seven eight has a, a three strikes bit to it, but is it possible that being transgender in West Virginia would get you labeled as a sex offender that would carry that weight of you know you, you have to register anytime you move kind of a thing? So here is where things get extremely bad because a lot of people are not paying attention to this. So what I've been reading to you is section 618A-1. Mm -hmm. In section 618A-2, under the penalties for exposing minors to obscene matter, any adult, and this is A under, eight, uh, under section 618A-2, any adult with knowledge of the character of the matter who knowingly and intentionally distributes, offers to distribute, or displays to a minor any obscene matter is guilty of a felony and upon conviction thereof shall be fined not more than $25,000 or confined in a state correctional facility for not more than five years or both. So what this is saying it looks like in the original bills that it would be a just a misdemeanor the first time, a misdemeanor the second time, and a felony the third time. But what this does is that it goes one step further. If anyone tries to argue that a transgender person is approaching a child, they would be guilty of knowledge of the character of the matter. They knew that they were a transgender person and intentionally distributing and displaying to a minor any obscene matter. Remember, the definition of obscene matter would be changed in section 61A2-1 so that obscene matter includes any transgender exposure. They would essentially, if you walk into the presence of a child, you are now guilty of a felony, you would be charged under this law, and you could be sentenced up to five years in a state correctional facility 
with a fine of $25,000. And if there were multiple children in that group, that would be multiplied times the number of children in that group. Wow. Oh, yeah, it is. Hold on. And one of the scariest things about this is this is the first time a bill like this has been shown in public. It is very likely going to be repeated in other states before the end of the year so that we know that trans antagonistic states are going to want to try to pass this where they are. I happened to look at the West Virginia um, Senate and House. It is predominantly Republican. The possibility that this could pass is very high. And that's just that's just terrifying. Um, the fact that this even has a vague chance of passing is terrifying. But the fact that uh, you know it has a, a, a any any kind of likelihood. Mm -hmm. Well, and we've seen very few trans antagonistic bills defeated. We've seen very few of them, you know, actually made null and void. Mm -hmm. Because even if they have been made null and void, they come back the next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just don't understand how you can make, uh, what is it? Well, it, in, in Virginia, at least it's, it's you know, 28,000 plus citizens just suddenly illegal. And in the United States, it's it's I think what uh, over five million of us. Um, because... Are you talking transgender people? Yes. Um, the numbers are really fluctuating right now, but you know, best case numbers would be close to five million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going off of sort of the average of about one point six uh, percent yeah. of the population, and that that works out to be over five million Americans and uh, over twenty eight thousand. West Virginians, and it's just it's it seems it seems absurd that a bill could be passed that would make that many people just straight up illegal, just well, for being who they are and who have been for for decades. It's absurd until you take a step back and you watch what the tactics are on the other side, because mm -hmm. what the tactics are on the other side is to recognize that we are not a people group that we are a group of mentally ill individuals who have received bad psychiatric interventions. And therefore, they are looking at us as victims, and they want to get us the help that we need because we have been deceived. Doesn't, doesn't seem like this approach. is very helpful. <laughs> I mean, that's the approach, though. They are looking at this as like, look, these transgender people have been convinced that they are allowed to be sexually obscene individuals in public because our demeanor has been connected with sexual obscenity for decades. And now they are using that history, which has been refuted over and over again, but they're using that definition that's decades old to make their entire argument. Mm. I agree with what Beverly commented in the chat that uh, it'll get passed and signed into law and then will be found unconstitutional, but what happens in between then, the level of harassment and just the the backstepping that we'll see in the amount of rights that people have in that state it'll be it'll it'll, it'll be unbelievable well and then so many people have to live that and but i mean please keep in mind that by the end of the year we could see this in maybe 5 to 7 states mm -hmm. this is just january and they're just introducing it this was a this was somebody throwing a line out in the water to see who's going to bite. West Virginia is insignificant in the grand scheme of things when it comes to the transgender population. It's not a hotbed of transgender activity, 
but this is going to be a test case for other states to look at this and say, oh, hold our beers. Um, you know, we can definitely match that because that's what we've seen them do. Mm -hmm. A judge denies a request for mental exams of 12-year-olds in Medicaid transgender lawsuit. What, uh, what brought this about? So this is originally out of Florida. This was a case that challenged the state prohibiting Medicaid from covering gender affirming care for transgender people, which, I mean, we knew that was coming, that people were going to challenge that. And we're seeing some of the results of that as the case is happening right now. But two 12 year olds are plaintiffs in this case. And the The, the attorneys for the DeSantis administration, the state of Florida, asked to be able to perform mental examinations on these 12-year-olds because they wanted to discover whether or not they were truly gender dysphoric so that they did qualify for gender-affirming procedures. Now, the judge denied that. U.S. District Judge Robert Hinkle released a two-page decision and basically, you know, came right out and said, you know, this is not going to happen. The decision noted that the state's motion identified an expert, Gita Nanjia, a South Carolina-based psychiatrist, that her qualifications as a psychiatrist who treats children and adolescents had no reference to addressing her as having experience with transgender youth. Her expert report, the decision said, not mentioned in the motion, says she has treated over a thousand patients with gender dysphoria, but the report does not indicate how many of those patients, if any, she supported in their identified gender. So basically you have a judge who's stepping in and say, Okay, state, you want me to consider this expert to take two 12-year-olds, give them a mental examination, and yet you have not shown without, with any credibility that this individual has the capacity to interview, evaluate, and diagnose transgender youth, much less provide for their care in their identified gender. This judge deserves a medal of some kind. Um, you know, basically is like, um, no, we're not doing this. Um, the judge pointed out in a November 15 scheduling order in which he said that under court rules, the plaintiffs could have, could have to undergo appropriate examinations, but no individual will be required to submit to an examination by a transgender denier or skeptic, because the current motion does not address whether Dr. Nanjia is a transgender denier or skeptic. This order denies the motion. Any renewed motion should address how many patients Dr. Nanjia has supported in their identified gender. Any renewed motion should also address how any finding from an examination might affect a ruling on the controlling substantive issue of whether treatments at issue are experimental. I mean, basically, this judge looked at the De DeSantis attorneys and said, get your shit straight. I already told you, don't bring any of this crap into my courtroom. I mean, that's what the judge is saying in probably some of the most covert judge language you could possibly do. Um, but the judge is looking beyond just the fact that, oh, this person has credentials in this area. This judge is looking at the case. Mm -hmm. And the credentials and whether or not the, the credentials actually fit with what's going on in the case. Yes. That's, that's great to hear. That is, that is so really awesome. good to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anti-LGBTQ extremism is no match for Minnesota's first trans lawmaker. Minnesota State Representative Lee Fink was sworn into office on January 3rd and is already hitting the ground running, trying to do their best to push back against anti-LGBTQ plus 
legislation. The first items up for bid on their agenda are focusing um, on banning conversion therapy, creating abortion access, and passing the trans refuge bill into law, thus making Minnesota the next state or another state in the trans refuge system that is being established. So Fink said, it's, it is because we have the trifecta that we can push forward. We can say this is a priority for our community and we want it to be heard with an expectation that it will follow through, or at least on the House side, I can't speak for the Senate. Gotta love that. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, you we have representation in this place and you know, being able to step forward and push for, you know, these rights within a state that, I mean, Minnesota has some good, you know, protections and good um, things happening in, in direction for trans, LGBTQ plus, and women's rights. But it's nice to see, you know, a little more intentional effort. Well, and I just love the steps forward that Minnesota has been making. Minnesota has yeah. proven itself to be quite a good refuge for trans people and yeah. uh, uh, just trans realism, <laughs> you know, right? yeah. the understanding of what it really means to be trans and what trans, why trans rights are important and why electing representatives is important. Uh, so uh, it, it's great to see even more representation there than we already did have. Yeah. All right, uh, moving on to Florida. Florida lawmakers consider extending don't say gay law up to sixth grade. This is not a surprise. We knew that this expansion was going to happen. Um, they're looking at moving the Parental Rights and Education Act up from the third grade to the sixth grade. And even though there's, you know, some of the background talk has been, oh, we can't go into high school because high school students should be mature enough to handle it. But at the same time, the original bill said that they can only be presented with material for which they are developmentally appropriate. So any parent can deem that their child is not developmentally at a place to receive that education. And so that's when the power of the parent to sue the school district comes into play. But right now they are moving this up to sixth grade. I would not be surprised if towards, well, probably next year, we'll see them push for complete. <sighs> I, I just, I can't even, I can't even comment. I can't, I, I, <laughs> it's just been so interesting to watch this um, my entire life. You know, I, I was, a little bit of aware of it when I went through middle school and was at that stage of, of you know, where they separate the, the two gray, the, the, you know, the two sexes and, and, you know, you watch the different videos and, and whatever. Um, and hearing just my entire life about conservatives trying to push back against sex education at all. And the parents should be able to do it, but the, then you find that the parents don't do it. They don't have the conversations. And then we have, you know, rampant teen pregnancy uh, because the their ideological idea that abstinence is the only way to go, um, mm. and it doesn't work when you're talking about horny teenagers a lot of the time. Right. Uh, so it's just been a, a really interesting to watch that kind of ebb and flow my entire life, and then now we have the "Don't Say Gay" bill. It's like you can't you can't teach them at all or say anything about it. Um, especially right. not if you're talking about in any way the existence of LGBT people, ideals, that sort of a thing. It's it's uh, right. it's really interesting. <laughs> Republican wants to expand the definition of child pornography to make it easier to ban LGBTQ plus books. This is not at all surprising, considering that uh, we talked about in West in Virginia. No, this is Wyoming, um, and a freshman representative has just stepped up and said, you know, what we want to do is we want to include in child pornography any visual depiction, including photograph, film, video, picture, cartoon, drawing, computer, or computer-generated image or picture, whether or not made or produced by electronic, mechanical, or other means, or any other form of depiction of explicit sexual conduct. It also you know, repeals the exemptions 
for those who possess or disseminate obscene materials for activities related to school, university, college, museum, and public libraries, which means that if somebody goes into a an art museum and there happens to be a nude statue there, the the protection around that art would no longer be in place. But essentially what they want to do is they want to ban anything that would allow youth access to obscene materials that would also define things such as sexual identity, gender identity, sexual orientation. So, um, yeah, and if we just if we just roll back to West Virginia, we are looking at them wanting to change the definition of obscene matter. Mm -hmm. So you can write this in in colored pencil, mark the date, and say Jeannie says this is going to include transgender people in Wyoming eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's the same playbook, just a different specific yep. thing that they're attacking. Yeah. Republicans say they, they will sue Arizona's governor because she protected LGBTQ plus people. That sounds like a logical reaction here. What's going on? Well, it is a logical reaction when you're an illogical people. The yeah. Republicans, the Republican lawmakers in Arizona, the Republican, you know, group that essentially, you know, just last week we reported on um, – wrote legislation that would, you know, out trans kids. But we also reported in the same week that the new governor, Katie Hobbs, had put into place an executive order that offered protections to LGBTQ plus state employees from discrimination. Well, that angered the Arizona Freedom Caucus and Republican State Representative Jake Hoffman and basically said that they are going to do everything to obstruct Governor Hobbs in every step of the process if she continues to utilize executive orders. So essentially, if the, if the governor uses executive orders for anything else, the Republicans are going to step in the way of the governor acting upon their constitutional right within the state. And their their obligation as an elected official to represent the the will and the rights of the people. In and Arizona, that's a tough call because half of the state is going to be in a place that agrees with the Republicans, and then mm -hmm. pe people in Phoenix and Tucson and a couple of little other places they would they would say, ah, this is not cool. Yeah, I just find it so interesting that one of the parties is about restricting the rights of citizens in America, where the other one is just like, no, they shouldn't be discriminated against. And that is going to get the Republican, again, talking about the Republican playbook, well, we'll just shut down government then because we're not going to get our way on everything all the time. So you're just not ever going to be able to accomplish anything. Right. Same thing we saw with, with um, Obama and you know, just basically – ever since well hell this goes all the way back to george bush um the 2000 election you know the the year of the hanging chad um <laughs> it's been a constant battle between the two sides since 2000 to say we're going to see what we can do to obstruct the other side mm -hmm. obstructing government obstructing the rights of the people interesting strategy yeah the GOP bill would throw librarians in prison if they didn't remove books about sexual or gender identity. North Dakota, which I happened to be speaking with somebody from North Dakota, and they showed me the list of 20-plus pieces of legislation that are currently being talked about in North Dakota. But this one would take a librarian, sentence them to 30 days in prison, a $1,500 fine if they do not remove, do not remove any items that depict sexual identity, gender identity, as well as sexual preference, sexual intercourse, or sexual perversion. 
again, lumping the stuff that's ridiculous and just absurd in with the, the things that everybody can agree are bad. Right. Um, and it's such a it's just such a dirty tactic. Yeah, Mike LaFour is the House Majority Leader who put this forward and said that public libraries contain books featuring disturbing and disgusting content and argued that a child's exposure to such content has been associated with addiction, poor self-esteem, devalued intimacy, increasing divorce rates, unprotected sex among young people, and poor well-being. Which so is poverty, but I don't see them doing anything to get rid of that shit. I'll have to look into that claim because that seems a little, that seems a bit silly here. Well, no, it's it's valid. It is. I mean, it's a valid claim. All right, that exposure to certain elements can be shown to increase the likelihood of the things that he listed, but poverty can do the same. Abuse can do the same. Early introduction to smoking and alcohol can do the same. See, it's not it's not about the it's not about the substance that they are exposed to. What it is is it's about the so the, the social ills that we experience as a nation in allowing children to fall through the cracks and allowing them to suffer the worst of society. Now, a public library full of books, not, not a contributing cause. It is a contributing cause to diminished Republican association, but it's not linked to, you know, the, the increase of these societal ills. So, I mean, this is not a He's not trying to quote facts, Emily. What he's trying to do is he's trying to fear monger. Yeah. Another one, GOP bill would fine people $1,500 for using the correct pronouns for trans people. So wow. right up front, this one didn't even make it out of committee. It came up and they were like, you're kidding, right? Um SB 2199 wanted to change the definition of gender, stating that words used to reference an individual's sex, gender, gender identity, or gender expression mean the individual's determined sex at birth, male or female. Um, the bill isn't just limited to students, though. The words referring to an individual person, employer, employee, contestant, participant, member, student, or juvenile must be used in the context of that person's sex as determined at birth. The bill also says that gender is established by the individual's deoxyribonucleic acid, which for most of us, we just say DNA. Um, you know, but, but the thing is, is that it's not the DNA that determines the gender. It is the sex chromosomes that are a part of DNA which are attributed to the development of primary and sex secondary sexual organs in development. Gender doesn't come along until after someone is born and brought into society. So there's one word that stood out to me there. In that Deoxyribonucleic list. acid? No, that one, that, one, that one seemed to make sense there. In the, in the whole doesn't make any sense sort of context, but contestant. Mm. So uh, if you go on the Price is Right and they use your preferred pronouns, uh, then Drew Carey could be fined fifteen hundred dollars, essentially. Okay, so <laughs> is that what kind of contestant they're talking about? Because that's what I—that's that, where my brain went, and I thought that was hilariously ridiculous. Okay, I hate to be the one to do this because. Um, because it's really going to ruin my reputation to say this. But most likely, it is in reference to a sporting event or another contest sponsored by an athletic uh, athletic or school association. Okay, so it is still school-related and not necessarily right. 
game show related. Not necessarily game show related, but it could be. It could be. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. The and more again, you know. I don't I don't want people to get this confused. I am still not a sport ball person. <laughs> I love the ways where I can push you in that direction though. Pu push uh, you to make comment on it at least. I think we have a sports story or two here tonight. I'll have to make sure that you have to do those. Ron DeSantis, I'm still in Florida. We're back to Florida. Demands universities give information about students' gender-affirming care. So more of this um, outing and registering of trans people. Yeah, and this one is scarier because now it is demanding information on adults. We're talking about universities. We're not talking about high schools. We're not talking about minors. We're talking about individuals who have met the criteria for being classified as an adult. We're talking about individuals who have, you know, reached that threshold where they have the protections of independent adult living. So now what happened? The DeSantis administration reached out to numerous Florida universities wanting to know the number of people that the universities provide services to who suffer from gender dysphoria. Now, at that juncture right there, suffering from gender dysphoria makes that a medical issue. And if a university released any information directly connected to a student's medical history, they would be putting themselves in the place of a lawsuit that would be out of this world. But as Autumn is saying, this is essentially one of the steps that's being taken to create a list of transgender people in Florida. Because it's no big step to go from how many students to let's look at the university's student body and determine who that is. So they are trying every way possible. And look, we're talking Texas and Florida have both now made overtures that look like the beginnings of a registration list. The idea that um, Ken Paxton in Texas went after the DMV motors um, information and how many people have changed their um, names and now you have DeSantis going after university students trying to find out how many services, how many universities are servicing gender dysphoric students. You have these two efforts to form what is basically a registration of transgender people. And at this point, it may not look like a big thing, but this is scary. This is very scary. Yeah. Yeah, because they're trying in legislative ways to to perform a genocide on trans and LGBT people, exactly. um, specifically trans people. That's that's mm -hmm. where the main attack is happening right now. Um, and then from the from that other side, from the registration side, that allows them to target and pinpoint individual people and come after them. You know, so so that once once they have the copycat of the West Virginia bill enacted. Now they have a list of everybody to specifically go after yep. and imprison. Yep. And all right. So y'all, this is, I'm not going to deny that my, the, the portion of my brain that works on conspiracy theories is running all of the numbers. It's definitely running all of the numbers. But the thing is, is that you take a registration list, you take the criminalization of transgender people, and you put that together with the other part of, how, of Senate Bill 278 in West Virginia, which would allow police to enter into a domicile of a suspected transgender person with a minor. That is all of the information that they would need to get a warrant. They would enter into that home. They would seize that transgender person. The minor would be taken and put, in, in, put into... Uh, the system of the state, and the domicile could be seized and sold at state auction. That's what the rest of 278 was about, was the use of property in association with obscene matter. 
So now we have all of the makings for um, essentially the early days of the the German uh, push to put Jews within the ghettos and ensure that they did not have freedom to move about in addition to going ahead and incarcerating them. One thing to take notice is that the West Virginia bills do not require that they have to be in a prison. They can be in a mental correctional facility as well. Yeah. Another vagary that they put into that law was just a correctional facility. Yep. So it would be very easy to put somebody in a psychiatric hospital under criminal uh, – in the criminal wing and put them through forced conversion therapy. Which is what we were talking about with the Republican platform in Texas. That is what they were moving toward. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Ohio school district sued after allowing transgender students to access communal bathrooms. So the Dayton area, Bethel local school district, um, had made it possible for transgender students to use restrooms of their identity. And American First Legal, which is a conservative, probably Christian-based law firm, has brought suit on the part of 18 anonymous parents and students because a 14-year-old transgender student was permitted to use the girls' restroom. The filing argues that restrooms and other intimate facilities should only be shared by persons of the same biological sex for a variety of reasons, including safety, privacy, modesty, religion, and historical views of sex. What one's biology has to do with safety, privacy, modesty, religion, and historical views of sex confounds this commentator. But at the same time, you know, it's a matter of saying, you know, there's been no evidence that th- that people are at risk. What we've seen is people having a panic response, and that panic response is their own damn business. It's not the transgender person who is causing them harm. It is their own panic that is causing the harm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, um, I don't know that we have it in in here, but there's a whole big hoopla going on over um, a YMCA where a girl who was in a, a, a teenage girl who was in a shower looked out for some reason. Um, I think she was maybe coming out of the shower stall um, and saw the backside of a, of a trans person and um, and I think who, who was, you know, so she ducked back into the stall and the trans person left. There was no, no there was nothing. There was nothing, nothing happened in the incident at all. Um, and yet that girl felt unsafe right? because she saw the backside of the trans person and read it as, you know, not what was supposed to be in, in that locker room and thus, you know, had this, this whole panic. And what that is, is that's a panic based on all of this rhetoric and fear mongering that's been happening that we're seeing. Again, there are no statistics that back up that, you know, people are in any way under greater risk for harm because of the acceptance of transgender people. Right. I mean, this is this is the the um, this is the Doberman Pinscher defense, meaning that. Well, a Doberman Pinscher is an aggressive dog. It's an aggressive breed of dog. Therefore, we are not going to allow Doberman Pinschers on our properties. You can't you can't have a Doberman Pinscher and have a certain apartment or live in a certain housing development or in a certain you know community or a certain county or a certain city. If you have a Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd or a a uh, pit bull or a Rottweiler, you can't own any of those dogs because they're aggressive breeds. Now, transgender people are an aggressive breed. <laughs> That's it. 
Oh, um, God. So from now on, if you are in a public space and somebody is looking at you weird, just look back at him and go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that That is one potential reaction. Yes. Look, if they think we're crazy, why not live into it? Why not give them crazy? Um, look, I, 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 yeah, I, this I, is serious shit, and I am trying to lighten it up as much <laughs> as I can, okay? <laughs> We've got, I, I mean, this is kind of like the episode of The X Files where the creepy family, and um, I don't know if, never mind, I'm not going <laughs> to. Now, now, let's not get into an, an episode synopsis. The X Files, when it was a really bad episode, it was also one of the funniest. So I'm trying to level it out. <laughs> And I still want to do an expose on the whole bathroom thing because I got into a big conversation about that today. And, you know, it's that it's the perceived perceived danger that um, cis women have been whipped into um, over what trans people are. You know, that that whole belief that trans people are pedophiles and sex offenders and just creeps trying to skis on women. Um, and you, so you've got that. It's just a kind of a straw man whipped up fear sort of a thing contrasted to a uh, Reuters article that I found uh, from a few years ago that said that one in four transgender uh, teens who are um, forced to use the, the bathroom that um, doesn't coordinate with their gender identity is sexually assaulted. Yeah. And that trans um, trans women, trans uh, trans girls who were born male um, are twice as likely to get um, sexually assaulted um, of the trans bunch. Yeah. Um, and so you've got this, the fear, and you've got actual statistics of the real actual danger for transgender people. And this perceived fear is trumping and taking precedent over the actual danger that, that trans people face. Yeah. Um, plus, the fact that my favorite thing to bring up is, you know, people are afraid of someone coming in and sexually assaulting, committing, you know, um, the R word against women, which just blows my mind because that is one of the most egregious felonies out there. Like we all agree that 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 is horrible. That rape is horrible. Um, and what they're saying is in their argument that making it illegal for trans people to use a bathroom is going to stop people from going in and raping women because while you're committing the most egregious felony possible if it is a misdemeanor to go into a room that has a an unlocked room that has a w on the door that is going to stop you and it's like what have you bumped your head on that doesn't make any sense the a person that is going to do that horrendous act is going to go what to whatever links and they don't care about the other things especially the freaking misdemeanor which by the way i wasn't able to find any laws um in america that specifically that say that it's illegal for people to use the opposite bathroom there's trespassing laws that sort of seem to um to can be applied um in the courtroom but there's nothing that specifically says it so technically and, i don't think and it's that illegal. is that is what law is referenced. It is a trespass, meaning that it is an area designated for a certain certain group, and if you enter into that without appropriate permissions, you are then committing a trespass. Mm. It's just like if you go into the back section of a store where it's marked employees only. If you take if you step into that portion of the store, you are now committing a trespass, and you can be, you know, they can call the cops on you. They don't mm. have to have a reason. You are committing a trespass. It's the same thing with the restrooms, and that's, you know, that's the, again, vagueness is the power of the government. You know, mm. if they keep it vague, they can use it for anything. Yeah. But like I said, it doesn't apply to to rapists because they're going to do what they're going to do regardless. So. Shannon, I disagree with you completely. Um, it's not specifically Southern Baptist states. Um, this is broader than just one 
single solitary branch of Christianity. This is across a swath of of different faith experiences. And, you know, it is it's when you have when you have evangelical Christians, radical feminists, and white supremacists all arguing the same thing, you're really kind of you're you're taking in a whole swath of demographic that can't be completely, you know, packed together neatly. Let's yeah. finally move on. <laughs> uh, hang on, one more comment there. One more comment. Okay, not moving. Yeah, on. we Thank have you. mass shootings, we had sex stings, abductions, drug overdoses. We also have, um, you know, inflation that is out the wazoo. We have corporations who are price gouging on many different areas because they are raking in record profits while at the same time sticking it to the consumer. We also have some very hard situations around the world in addition to a two-party controlled system of government that is nothing but two bickering children in the back seat of a station wagon in the 1970s driving through Death Valley. So, yeah, we are the grand distraction. We are what politicians are using to keep everybody focused on one thing while they go and do something else. So every time a politician starts screaming about transgender people, look and see what their left hand is doing. Look and see what's going on behind their back. Look and see what they are doing that they don't want you to see because they are the greatest prestidigitators in the history of the world. Look at the birdie, look at the birdie. Yep. All right, now we'll move on to Utah, where Republicans exclude cysteine breast implants from trans care ban. So this is what we were talking about before. Exactly the exclusions that they work into these anti-trans bills that are it's the, the mental gymnastics, the abandonment of logic. It's mind blowing sometimes. What is going on as we dive into this one? So I just want you to know right now, okay, Emily, mm -hmm. I respect your leadership and your 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 authority, you know, as head of the transverse. And you told me I need to cut down on the drinking on the show, okay? This <laughs> no. one I want a fucking whiskey for because this one, this one takes takes in insanity to a whole new level mm -hmm. so senate bill 16 has come up in utah that would ban gender affirming care for trans youth specifically targeting surgical procedures as many of these do but there are none happening in utah democratic utah senator senator luz escamilla proposed an amendment because the Republicans are promoting this as about protecting kids from create uh, from from making you know monumental mistakes in altering their body as teenagers. So Senator es Escamilla offered a an amendment to the bill, and she submitted the amendment that said simply. A ban on plastic surgery on all minors unless it is medically necessary. Now, all surgery. Now, we've talked about this. We did a story toward the end of the year where we talked about the, the number of plastic surgeries that are being done on teens and how many of those are aesthetic plastic surgery procedures. Not only that, but you pointed out that they're gender affirming care. They are gender affirming care. Um, so the senator argued, if we are going to take away the ability for parents to make decisions with their providers, then all children should be included and not targeted at a specific group of kids. Wow, fundamentally logical. 
There we go. There's a little bit of it. A little bit of logic sprinkled in on top. Senator Michael Kennedy, who was the chief sponsor of the bill, said that he opposed banning breast implants for cisgender kids. Do you know why? Do you know why, class? Do you know why you would have somebody who would say, no, we need to let these teenagers get their little hooties boosted? Why, why would a why would a, a male, a cisgender male, say that teenage girls should be allowed to get breast implants? Wow, that's that's hard. I I don't know the answer to that. That's Here's not the argument that Senator Michael Kennedy proposed. The reason why cisgender kids should be able to get breast implants is they've been getting them for a long time, so that makes it acceptable. Um, haven't transgender people been getting care for a while now? Um, I don't think that that argument holds any water, and uh, I think no, that the and more does obvious my answer. When I have it, but I can't have it. So, I think the more uh, the more obvious answer um, uh, makes a lot more sense. Yeah, um, that this is a creep. So, when the final vote was taken in the committee, all five Republicans voted against the amendment. The Democrats, all two of them, voted for the amendment. The bill went forward as originally written, which would allow cisgender femme persons to receive breast implants. And it passed committee and is going to the full Senate. Hmm. This is the identical sort of idea to the fact that they will ban gender affirming care for for people yeah. and leave the loophole in it that they can perform sexual sex, essentially sexual reassignment surgery on infants if they're if the doctor can't tell what their genitalia means as far as their sex the doctor can arbitrarily decide non-consensual mm -hmm. gender assignment surgery that is the big thing to remember because these children, we are being told, don't have the ability to consent mm -hmm. to gender affirming care. Mm -hmm. So gender assigning care has to be recognized as it is being done as non-consensual. Yep. Em, I got us completely off track. We were just going to go through the states like this. So um, yeah, we were, we were, we're long overdue for a break, and we've got a lot to go through. Let's uh, let's jump into these then. Let's let's make this a rapid fire as we get out of this segment here. Wisconsin GOP makes conversion therapy legal again. God damn it! Yeah, they had just banned it um, in 2020, and now the Republicans have gotten back into control, and they have. Um, reverse that, and now conversion therapy is once again legal in that state. Can we move there and convert more people to trans? Like, like just force them, in, you know, just take the the cis male um, leaders and and apply conversion therapy to them. This That's is, what we've been doing, according to all of the trans antagonist opponents that I see. It doesn't work. It just harms people. Ugh. Um, Mississippi bill uses abortion ban tactic to target trans care. Yep. What they have done in this bill is that they have included uh, doctors who knowingly perform gender reassignment surgery. They have lumped them in with doctors who perform or induce an abortion. Um, so they've lumped all of them together into the same category and, you know, assigned the same punishment to all of them. Going back to Florida, we just can't get out of there. A state employee alleges Florida sidestepped the process in excluding gender-affirming care for Medicaid. So this is this is a shock to no one. Um, basically, somebody is coming forward with the, with the evidence that says that the group that was responsible for determining that 
gender affirming care would not be accessible in Florida, that would be the Agency for Healthcare Administration, ignored all of the medical standards of gender affirming care to make a decision. They just completely just, no, we're not going to mess with this. So somebody has come forward. They provide evidence of how they have just basically taken what they wanted out of medical studies and used that to justify eliminating gender affirming care. Um, Barely Beverly, they didn't have to run it past the governor. All they had to do was get that uh, overturned in a committee. There, um, let's jump straight in because we've got a lot to cover. Anti-LGBTQ plus one million moms group rages over Disney cartoon with talking fire trucks and apparently some lesbian moms. What's going on here and why is this a thing? So Fire Buds is a show on Disney Junior. Um, and the one million moms is, has basically, you know, come out in protest because one of the main characters, Violet, has two moms in the Vega Vaughn family. Um, in addition, you may remember that the One Million Moms came out against Lightyear because there was a lesbian kiss of approximately 0.47 seconds long in that movie. Also, back in 2017, there was a same-sex couple in an episode of Doc McStuffins. And, of course, if you keep up with it, Blue's Clues went pride. <laughs> I don't know if you've had a chance yet to watch Strange World, but the family in that just sort of seems like they're trying to cram in a ton of inclusion. It's, it's like in the context of what's going on right now, it's sort of funny to, to look right. at. It was, was funny for me. It's a um, mixed race couple. Their son is gay and they are they have a three legged dog. <laughs> like They're just trying to shoehorn all the inclusion in. And I'm glad uh, the I was like, dog's yeah. in there. What's that? I said, I'm glad the three legged dogs in there. Right. Um, side note again, isn't one million moms like uh, uh, several thousand moms? Yeah, it's about forty five thousand. Yeah. It's is one million moms or forty five thousand Karens. It, it's it goes either way. <laughs> yeah, however the math works on that. A gender critical activist quotes Adolf Hitler in a speech against trans rights at part at Poser, Posey Parker rally. Um, not <laughs> not at all shocking. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually it is shocking because you had an individual who spoke out at this gender critical event and was directly quoting Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler and essentially was talking about the big lie and said, now this is, this is funny, okay? Um, she said, do you know the big lie? The big lie was first described by Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. That's and the 2020 then, election thing? No. <laughs> uh, but then began to quote, you know, that, you know, the big lie is such a big lie that ordinary people like us think, well, that can't be a lie because I would never tell such a big lie as that when they only lie in small ways. But then... Remember what I just said. It was first described by Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf, written in the nineteen late 1920s, early 1930s. Um, the big lie, she goes on to say, was begun by men in the early part of the 20th century. It began when they had an erotic fantasy, and they decided they were going to sell us the big lie. And what is the big lie? The big lie is that trans women are women, but they're not, nor I see they're not, are they? They're men, and we know that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just so tired of, of having to justify who I am and why I am, which is backed by so many medical organizations um, and so much scientific fact that it's just I'm not even going to address it. Uh, a trans woman was banned from praying at a yeshiva university synagogue so talia avrahami we talked about um a few months back after they came out as non-binary they were released from their position at a teaching school mm -hmm. a jewish teaching school um in an attempt to try and you know just connect with their faith again they began to attend the um 
um, shoot, now I've lost the name of it. But the local shul that they were, you know, that they were closest to. In the process of that, the local rabbi switched, and the individual who came in was not as accepting of them, and then banned them from attending and wow. and making prayers. Wow. An Iowa Catholic diocese banned preferred pronouns and will force LGBTQ plus students to go to bathrooms of their biological se sex. And advocates say the policy is part of a growing trend causing severe harm. Yeah, this is the Diocese of Des Moines. It includes 17 schools and 80 parishes in southwest Iowa. It went into effect a week ago. It, the policies are established as binding for diocesan parishes, schools, organizations, and institutions of the Catholic Church in the Diocese of Des Moines. So under the policy, no one may designate a preferred pronoun. The diocese said people must use the bathroom or locker room that matches their biological sex, and they are to follow the dress code or uniform that accords with their biological sex. Participation in school or parish activities must be consistent with the biological sex of the participant. The diocese also barred using gender affirming medical treatments like puberty blockers, saying no person is permitted to have on site or to distribute any medications for the purpose of gender reassignment. Anyone who questions their gender should be guided to appropriate ministers and counselors. That's fucking scary right there. Yeah. Hmm. Let's uh, keep going through because we've got a whole lot of good stories to get to at the end here. So we'll just keep pushing through. There's good news. There's good news. There's good news. It's just all for the rainbow. Us, um, just, just hang in tight. We're, we, oof. This, this, might, this one might get a little bit more fun. Christian conservatives petition to cancel HBO's, HBO Max's Velma. Um, interesting that, that uh, conservatives are calling for canceling i thought uh, cancel culture was only a democratic thing wow surprising. so um i've not i've not partaken of uh hbo max's velma series um mm -hmm. so i went to the only expert that i know andrew and basically he said the show was garbage anyway so it really didn't matter so um yeah All right. A teenager saw a trans woman showering in a, in a women's locker room. It ended with riot police. I think I uh, spoiled the spoiled this one a little earlier. I didn't realize we had this one. Well, you spoiled the front end. Now we get to spoil. Now we get to talk about the back end. Emily's already laid out that there was a person in the shower stall. A cisgender girl sees transgender girl in the shower, uh, makes a hullabaloo. And then a protest is called for, and that's when things get a little bit crazy because a, the anti-trans group for choice arranged a protest. About 300 people showed up, and what happened was is that protesters and counter-protesters were started, you know, sort of facing off against each other, and then all of a sudden. Um, a hockey game broke out. No, a riot broke out, and they had to call in the cops to break up the um, the the riot. Just a quick note on this one. We already commented a lot on this. No incident happened in the locker room. Nope. The cisgender girl saw the backside of a trans girl um, and freaked out, um, and that's where all of this comes from. There yep. was no assault. There was no attempted assault. There was no comment. There was nothing. This next article, this next uh, site that we're sorting, uh, sourcing here is about Beyond WPATH. What is significant about this piece here? Okay, this is a counter movement uh, called evidence-based gender-affirming care. And evidence-based mm -hmm. gender-affirming care is essentially calling out gender-affirming care and criticizing it. It is a gender critical approach. It does not want youth to be exposed to gender affirming care. Now they make it sound all nice and pretty and they, you know, they say, look, let's leave it for them to get to be adults. 
we already know the statistics of what happens with kids who are not allowed to get gender affirming care as kids. But this is a group of mental health professionals, public health scientists, um, allied organizations and individuals. It's also filled with detransitioners. But this particular declaration is calling out WPATH as having discredited itself for continuing its work in allowing youth and minors to receive some form of gender affirming care that they can transition in their youth and then be able to move on into adulthood. Now, a recent study has said that 98% of people who begin, excuse me, begin gender transition as a teen continue into adulthood with their transition. They are calling all of that into question, even though 98% of people have continued on in the process. We know that this is not as critically as harmful as they are pointing out. Are there people who would benefit from some supervision? Absolutely. Are there doctors who are going beyond protocols? Absolutely. But are we at a place where we want to throw out WPATH? No. If you are a transgender person and you run across somebody selling this, please inform them of what this actually represents. Mm-hmm. Mental health benefits of gender affirming hormones for teens persist for two years in a new study. I mean, this is fabulous. This is coming out in um, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. 300 adolescents were followed for two years after initiating hormone treatment. The results, you know, basically show that there is an improvement of mental health and that these, you know, these therapies are doing the work that they are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, they are taking care of those issues and kids are coming out in a healthier place than if they did not have them. Well, and the the interesting thing is you, when you talk about gender care for trans youth, um, you know, you get the the pushback of, you know, but there are these detransitioners that, you know, mm-hmm. it, it was horrible for them. And if you look into the detransitioner stories, the ones that I found the the most vocal um, that people are, are bringing forth, at, these are not transgender people. These are people who had um, mental illness, um, who were, were neurodivergent in some way, um, who needed a significant amount of help and were diagnosed as trans people and thus sort of sent down the pathway. That's bad. I admit that that's bad. But the solution to that is not to ban gender affirming care because it's a proven form of care that actually helps people. The situation then becomes a diagnosis. It's a diagnosis problem where there's something that needs to be addressed in that but banning the, the gender affirming care as proven here is, is harmful to mm-hmm. the people that it actually helps. Exactly. And again, you know, the, the previous study that I cited, you know, it was a 98% carryover from youth to adulthood. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they're arguing, they're arguing on the minority. And in this case, there are arguments that can be made that there do need to be changes, but to throw out the entirety of WPATH's, you know, procedures and and the, you know, the the interventions that they talk about, to throw all of that out when it is proven to be effective in saving kids' lives. And improving the quality of their lives. And improving the quality of them. You know, it's, you know, we're throwing out a lot more than the baby with the bathwater. Trans activist makes glaringly obvious point about Scottish gender bill and single sex spaces. I'd love to watch the video on this one. This is amazing because um, Heather Herbert came out and, and just was point on in talking about why the issue of you know gender recognition reform needs to be dealt with and heather herbert asked the person who was doing the interview a journalist 
when was the last time you needed to show your birth certificate when you went to the toilet? And after about a pause like that long, the journalist said, never. So Herbert goes on to, to add, Nobody asks you for your birth certificate or gender recognition certificate or any other kind of documentation when you go to the loo or when you go to a single-sex changing room. And this is the question that people have been asking. Allies have been asking those who want to say, well, transgender women don't belong in the women's restroom. They have been asking, who are you going to assign to check their genitals? I think we have an entire slate of Southern Baptists who are lining up for that job, but let's just kind of uh, leave it there. And what was the um, the uh, politician Kennedy who was uh, for breast implants for young, yeah, for teens, yeah. teen girls? Yeah. Facebook and Instagram may change their adult nudity policies to be more trans inclusive. That seems like good news. Yeah. So now, um, it seems that. Female nipples are, you know, pretty much verboten on mm -hmm. uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, only very specific settings can and context can they be used. But there has been talk among the sort of the, you know, the ombudsman alms, of uh, Facebook and Instagram, who basically says we need to reevaluate this, that you know, so that transgender people are represented appropriately, so that you know, individuals who, who really are, you know, impacted negatively by this can at least be treated equally to others. This is our. Is this, is this the one? No, I, I jumped ahead. We got two more stories before we get to the good news. Sorry. Um, it's a straight line from QAnon's pedophilia hysteria to the GOP's groomer rhetoric. Um, what's going on here? Chaya Rachik showed up on QAnon conspiracy theorists um, Diana Lorraine uh, show and did an interview. And the funny thing is, is the two of them got to talking. It sounded like they were old college buddies uh, they were, you know, they were dorm sisters and they haven't seen each other for a long time. But the thing that they got into was basically, you know, Democratic libs and transgender groomers. And their conversations were so overlapping with each other that it sounded like they were a natural continuation of one, of one another. So libs of TikTok and QAnon are basically just married together completely. Wow. Not surprising. Charlie McDonald, Charlie McDonald, let me get the pronunciation right here. Let's try it again. Charlie McDonald returns to YouTube after proudly coming out as trans. A lot's changed. So British YouTuber Charlie McDonald, also known as Charlie is so cool like, um, stepped back from the public eye a few years ago and purged their account on YouTube. Now they have come back announcing that she goes by she, they, she began hormone replacement therapy, added that her first name is Charlie, and that she has plans to legally formalize that change. So we have a YouTuber who has pretty much, again, you know, stepped out of the limelight to come back into their authenticity. Uh, there have been a couple of other very uh, big YouTube uh, personalities who have done the same. So this is, this is going to be an interesting... Um, Thing to see what happens in this transition, so to speak. Yeah. Transmiss Universe owner gives rousing speech about turning pain into power. Yeah. So, uh, Jaka Fong Jaka Jakra Jutatip, I'm trying to work on that name, uh, or Ann Jukra Jutatip, uh, took possession of the Miss Universe pageant package. So, she, she, or, yeah, she owns. Uh, Miss Universe, Miss Teen Universe, Miss USA, the whole the whole shooting match. Um, but she came out and, you know, as as Miss Universe was um, 
concluding, she stepped out on the stage and she says, you know, it's been 70 years that the Miss Universe organization has been run by men, but now time is up. Now is the moment for women to take the lead. From now on, Miss Universe is going to be run by women, owned by a trans woman, for women all around the world to celebrate the power of feminism. So fabulous, fabulous, fabulous stance. That's great. I love uh, so, the strong association between trans and feminism and uh, women's rights and and women and female power and female empowerment. Like all of those things are great. I'm so excited to see what she does with that organization. Yep. Moving on, a trans woman <laughs> founded a group to help trans people leave the U.S. due to rising levels of hate. So Wren Willows is a 50 year old transgender woman and she was looking at, you know, finding ways to leave the country because of everything that's been going on. But specifically two things that have happened in her own life. First of all, in March of 2021, she was strangled in a public restroom nearly to death um, while she was traveling across the state for work. Um, she says that there are like 30 states that I wouldn't even drive through. And then, of course, the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. Now, um, Wren is looking to create this organization called Transport, an organi organization that allows trans people to become expatriates and flee the country. Wren herself is looking to move to Iceland. In fact, as I chatted with her this afternoon, she already has an apartment there, and I'm working up an interview, so I'll be talking with her next week to get a little more in-depth information about this. But we are looking at, you know, the opportunity to see certain, you know, certain organizations begin to prop uh, to sort of pop up across the country and help transgender people get out of this country because it doesn't look good for many areas of it. Yeah. By this the way, there's two of those stories. Uh, oh, that's two in a row. The uh, yep. the brave trans woman. Yep, helping others flee. <clears throat> All right, let's move to uh, Britain then. Uh, trolls tried to cancel British Library for its gender neutral to toilet, but it backfired badly. How did it backfire? Well, um, Twitter user by the name of Sarah posted a picture of two toilet doors in the British Library, accompanied by an emoji of a woman face palming. No, Beverly, the toilet didn't backfire. The effort to <laughs> shame the toilet backfired, which when you get to shaming toilets, that's... <clears throat> Anywho, um, both of the doors feature gender symbols. One featuring the male symbol, the other featuring male, female, disabled, and trans symbols. The door that the user took issue with is a single cubicle toilet designed for people with different ability and different mobility access. It is available for everyone, and it is not a large bathroom where everyone can go in at the same time. It just happens to be a single holer. Um, but of course, people are going to step up and do the best to let others know how ridiculous they look. Um, one, roser, one user um, pointed out that's a disability bathroom, and it clearly states there's a women's restroom down the corridor, and it is. The sign is very clearly posted right there. There's a women's restroom down the corridor. Um, <laughs> the one on the left is a disabled toilet, so it is for all genders. The one in the right has urinals, so it's for men. Women can give it a go if they like. And the women's loo is across the room, but don't let facts get in the way. So Twitter came back on this person and just shamelessly abused them of any attempt they may have had to shame the loo. North Carolina okays LGBTQ plus vanity license plates. What's going on here? License plates with the words gay pride, lesbian, queer were previously not available. Shockingly. Really? in North Carolina. But <clears throat> for the first time in 20 years, the state's Department of Motor Vehicles reviewed its policies on the forbidden words at the direction of the DMV commissioner. So initially, 
um, the team from the department's vehicle services division reviewed the list. After identifying entries as questionable, they reviewed them, referred them to a committee on communications, which basically 239 items were removed from the list, including more than two dozen terms related to the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community. Now, still prohibited are terms like bisexual and gay sock, um, as well as some terms relating to reproduction and ethnicity. Interesting. But on large part, in North Carolina, at least on license plates, you can say gay. Yes, you can. Protesters at a drag queen story hour were met with a rainbow wall protecting attendees. Baltimore, Maryland, which Baltimore should be one of the safest areas that we have. Um, the Baltimore Enoch Pratt Free Library was hosting a drag queen story hour. Across the street, um, a group of protesters showed up and, you know, basically tried to cancel it. But counter protesters showed up and began to create you know, an, a brilliant umbrella of, I mean, a, a brilliant rainbow of umbrellas and flags and sheets to block the signs while playing Disney and Broadway music to drown out protesters. Oh, um, I love that, that, you know, the nonviolent protest and just blocking out, blocking out the other side, not engaging, not engaging in, in you know, a fight or anything, just, just saying, nope, nothing to see here. Ireland reveals ambitious plan to become best place to be LGBTQ plus in Europe. So LGBT Ireland has produced uh, or has introduced a goal that over the next five years, they have a plan to make Ireland the best place in Europe to be LGBTQIA plus. And it's basically a, a move to focus on research, LGBTQ plus awareness training and combating anti-trans views within the country. Uh, it wants to aim to offer more help to LGBTQ plus refugees and asylum seekers and advocating for certain legislative reforms in Ireland. That's great. Looks like we need to put uh, them in touch with Rin, huh? And, yeah. and make, make a direct pipeline there. Absolutely. Nightlife safe space for LGBTQ plus community tested in Amsterdam. Amsterdam. So Amsterdam has always been sort of, you know, the the high watermark of anything goes, especially when it comes to being outside of societal standards. But um, right now they are seeing, you know, pushback um, from protests and, and violence in the same as many other places within the world. But now um, there is a portion of Amsterdam in the, you know, basically the district where people go out at nights that is creating a safe space for people of the LGBTQ plus community to, to go out and experience that nightlife and, and, you know, be able to go out as themselves because, you know, they were having to hide themselves because they didn't feel safe. So this is a direct intentional movement by the city of Amsterdam to, to sort of create this space for people to feel good and, and be able to go out and celebrate themselves. That's wonderful. It's yeah. sad that it's it's got to come to this, but it's wonderful that there is that space. Yes. The Church of England. In our final story here, we've we're over time, but just barely. <laughs> the Church of England apologizes to LGBTQI plus people for shameful treatment. So, this is a good news, bad news, good news sort of thing. Okay. The apology comes days after the Church of England set out proposals developed by the bishops that said, that showed that they were going to refuse to allow same-sex couples to get married, but said that priests could bless them in church, meaning they wouldn't perform the ceremony. They get married outside of the church. They came in and the priest would be able to bless the marriage. Um, but then <clears throat> they come out and the, you know, the bishops apologize saying, we have not loved you as God loves you, and that is profoundly wrong. We affirm 
publicly and unequivocally that LGBTQI plus people are welcome and valued. We are all children of God. The occasions on which you have received a hostile and homophobic response in our churches are shameful. And for this, we repent. The Church of England is, you know, um, the official church of, it is the official church of England. It replaced the Catholic Church. Um, but this is a huge step forward. The, the Anglican Communion also was associated with the Episcopal Church here in the United States. That relationship has broken. But, you know, the Anglican Church now stepping forward and saying, just after talking about we're not going to perform your marriages, but saying, you know what, we've kind of messed up with y'all in the past. Therefore, we recognize that and we repent and we're going to, you know, at least in word, make the effort to show you appropriate equal love. And, you know, words only go so far. But the thing is, is as, as we've proven over here and lots of other places, how horrible, how many bad things can come from bad rhetoric and things like that. And so if we have an organization like this, especially in a prominent organization in England, like the Church of England, saying things like this and, and coming out and, and coming out for LGBTQ plus folks in, in any way at all is a really good step. What is that smirk for? Do you disagree? Yeah. Okay. Floor is yours. Um, so who also lives in England? Uh, lots of people. I can think of, you know, there's J.K. Rowling and okay, let's Boris stop Johnson right there. and... J.K. Rowling is associated with a movement of individuals who have named themselves as trans-exclusionary radical feminists. Mm -hmm. This group of people that has been pushing the narrative that transgender women are just men who are predators hates the Church of England. Mm -hmm. of so the rhetoric is not impacted by the move of the Church of England. And in fact, what we have seen over the last 40 years is a sig significant decline of influence by the Church of England on society within the UK. They have very little actual public impact when it comes to making these kind of announcements because they're barely recognized as any sort of authority anymore in the UK. Hmm. But that's where we can disagree and be friends. Yeah. I love you all. Thank you all so much for coming. For Genevieve Bergman, for Kari Aiden in the booth, I'm Emily, wishing you good night and good news. Thank you, everyone.